Welcome back to Free Speech Nation. So our next story hasn't had much traction in mainstream media, but it is an important one in the battle for free speech. So the Constitutional Court of Colombia has overturned a decision that forced the Colombian social media influencer, Kika Nieto, to take down a video in which she expressed her Christian belief that marriage is between a man and a woman. She'd been facing legal proceedings since April last year after a case initiated by a well-known lawyer and LGBT QIA plus activist. So joining me to discuss this is journalist uh, Georgia Gilholy, who's been following the case closely and from San Francisco by the senior counsel in Latin America for ADF International, Thomas Enriquez. Thank you both for joining me. Thank you, Andrew. So, so Georgia, I'm going to come to you first, if you don't mind. Um, can you give us some kind of background to this case? Just because it, we're not very familiar with this one. This hasn't gain much traction, um, but it, this, it, this is a case that's been overturned, so it mm -hmm. looked bad at first, didn't it? What happened here? Yeah. I mean, uh, in terms of the fact that it's got not got much media traction, I suppose one of the reasons for that is probably that these kind of cases, they seem to be ten a penny nowadays, mm. right? And also, of course, with um, this uh, particular lady being quite famous in the, um, the Spanish language sphere, she's not necessarily well known in, let's sure. say, the UK or the US. Um, but so the case that um, you sort of touched on yourself, um, this woman, Kika uh, Nieto, uh, she's resident in Colombia. She is a social media, you know, star over there. She has 8 million followers, which is, you know, who can even imagine yeah. uh, what sort of influence she has. Um, so she did an AMA video, which stands for Ask Me Anything. And it's something that a lot of YouTubers do. I'm sure some of you probably come across those kinds of Q&A videos, um, answering personal questions. And she sort of went into her beliefs on marriage. She said that she believes in, you know, the traditional Christian uh, teaching on marriage, which is obviously, as most of you can guess, you know, between a man and a woman, etc. Um, or not, etc. I suppose, oh. <laughs> in that case. Yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's yeah, a yeah, full yeah, stop yeah. at that point. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, um, to varying degrees. Um, and so she then sort of gave very, you know, uh, she explained it very civilly. She gave a caveat. She said sort of, you know, I have, I have gay and lesbian friends who I love very much. And we just sort of agree to disagree, you know, um, I just don't think you should judge me for having this opinion. And essentially what followed from this is some um, radical or progressive activists, however you want to frame them, mm. really um, brought a case against her. Um, they said, you know, what she said was, was it illegal in its capacity of being offensive or, or rather um, it, it should be taken down from YouTube at least. Right. So <laughs> let, can I just bring Thomas in here at this point? Because I'm struggling to understand why a case could have been brought against her, given that the, the, the comments that she made was simply a matter of religious conviction. Well, thank you very much for having Andrew. And yes, it's um, a very much a particularity of the Colombian legal system where anybody can just bring up a lawsuit against you on this sort of uh, scenario. So uh, she was just amenable to being sued by this uh, activist that was um, obviously in disagreement with what she was saying. And she saw herself in the receiving end of the lawsuit for uh, over two years, or well, no, not two years, but during the, the better part of this last year, uh, legal proceedings all the way up to the Constitutional Court where she finally got uh, justice. Okay, I think we're struggling with Thomas. Oh, he's back now, Thomas. Sorry, we've lost you there for a moment, but if you'd like to continue, please do. Well, no, to, just to answer your question, um, I mean, uh, this is one of the crazy things that we see in Latin America, and unfortunately, it's not one. Uh, it's not the only sort of case that we see coming up. Uh, more and more, we have uh, you know, very grave challenges to freedom of speech, not only in Colombia but also in Mexico, where there's just uh, a, a generalized, I would say, erosion uh, of the respect for freedom of speech uh, in, in the context of democratic societies. You know, we don't usually look at these countries as. Um, you know, authoritarian cultures at all. And yet it's uh, surprising the rate to, at which we see uh, that, you know, people are just being taken to court and not only by private individuals, but in the case of Mexico, actually being prosecuted by the state itself on account of uh, think crimes, really. And can you give us some sense of the extent of this problem? I mean, how many people are being prosecuted simply for their opinions? Well, fortunately, in Colombia, Kika's case, uh, I think, was the, the spearhead going into, uh, you know, more aggression towards people that, with whom you disagree. Um, I think that in this case, the fact that she was willing to stand up, fight, and just take her case all the way to the constitutional court um, meant something. And it just gave a clear example of what you can do if you stand up to defend your own rights. Uh, Mexico is a different case altogether. And, and like, especially in the context of elections, and this is the crazy thing about it, is that 
um, you know, there's specialized electoral courts that have uh, jurisdiction to hear complaints from the general public, members of different political parties against just, you know, private individuals even uh, exercising their right to free speech in the context of elections that voice their concerns or their opposition to candidates or political parties for, for different reasons, moral reasons, political reasons, and they get taken to court. So we are now working and with um, allies in Mexico on, for instance, a case of just a you know, private citizen that took to Twitter to oppose a candidate to the federal legislature uh, in which, uh, and she was a, a big proponent of abortion legislation in Mexico. He opposed. He basically spelled out the position that he thinks abortion is murder, and he has been now convicted by Mexican court for saying something that is, uh, to their view, derogatory against women, discriminatory, and a form of gender-based political violence. And so, he's not the only one. So this is very worrying. I'm going to bring Georgia in here because I, I think this is a, a worrying development, isn't it? That ultimately we're now in a situation uh, where, I mean, this woman, this, this, this YouTube influencer wasn't saying anything uh, she wasn't inciting violence. She wasn't uh, saying, you know, gay people should be hurt in some way. There was nothing like that at all. And as you point out, she's actually being very, uh, very uh, tolerant and compassionate about the gay community. So do you think that this is a growing problem when it comes to maybe specifically Christian beliefs and whether this is, this is restricted to Latin America or are, is there a risk that this could come here? Would you prefer me to answer? Yes, than... Georgia, sorry. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think, you know, just judging the global context at the moment, we have approximately 67% of the world's population, unfortunately, living in countries where their right to religious expression and religious practice is severely restricted. So absolutely, this is not just a problem for Christians. It's not just a problem for Colombia and Latin America. Unfortunately, it's a massive global issue. Um, and in terms of this case, I mean, you know, as Andrew was saying, as Thomas was saying, um, she expressed it in a perfectly civil manner. And the problem is when, it, when we get to this point when you could possibly be prosecuted, and although fortunately this woman was able to overturn the case, she went through financial, personal turmoil, um, some of the quotes and, and a lot of articles about this, she refers to sort of, you know, being terrified at police possibly knocking on her door. Because, you know, if you're a regular person who's had no contact with law enforcement throughout your life, you would be scared of that kind of contact with mm. the legal system. Um, so it's not even just about whether she's prosecuted or not. It's about the fact that this, you know, it, it's a joke that this is even I mean, gets to this point, right? That's a really good point. But that actually, it sends a kind of signal out, doesn't it? It sort of says, beware, you know, don't express your opinions unless they are absolutely in line with, with the approved dogma, you know, and that, that could be... Uh, so it's, and this is, in a sense, how cancel culture works, isn't it? It's, it's that you, you have examples like this, high-profile examples, that, that make people nervous about saying what they believe to be true. Would you say that's right, Georgia? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think because the term cancel culture is, is thrown around for a lot of things that sort of, you know, they refer to varying degrees of, I guess, I guess um, people being uh, harassed or maybe even, you know, possibly put in prison like this woman mm -hmm. um, for their opinion. I think that it can sort of get a bit, a bit lost in the haze of the news cycle and people forget that, you know, they are, there are really grave situations like this in Colombia and other parts of the world where people can, you know, not just have people, you know, being nasty to them on Twitter, they can face, um, you know, their life being plunged into absolute chaos. You know, this woman, yes. just a normal woman, you know, a wife, a mother, she has better things to do than deal with this nonsense. Yeah, absolutely. And Thomas, just, we, we don't have long, but I'd just like to come to you for the final thought on this one. Do you see this as a, a very positive, optimistic uh, development in, insofar as, do you think maybe this will be a turning point with these kinds of problems and that maybe we'll see fewer prosecutions of this kind in the future? I think unfortunately, no. I think that they're going to keep coming. Um, but I think that what Kika cases show is that uh, a lot of times the process is the punishment. And as Georgia was saying, uh, you, the legal system just works against you unless you're willing to go all the way up to the top and finally find protection for your free speech. Um, I mean, kudos to Kika for being brave enough to actually do so. And I think that she just sets an example for people to know that they can find justice in their current legal system. It's just a matter of having to fight for it. And unfortunately, not everybody's willing to do that. I, I, we do hope that she is an example to everybody in saying that you do have free speech, but you have to defend it. You have to stand up for it. Excellent point. And thank you both uh, for joining me today. Uh, Georgia and Thomas, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.